Good morning, Amy Affield. Hi. Good morning, Professor Valenza. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, I am so happy you're joining us again. My students met you um, prior to their ex very basic experience with dialogue search, and um, they know just a little bit about you, but I'm going to remind them of the basics, and then I'd like you to fill in what the big stuff in your mind is about Amy Affeld, and also maybe a little bit of anything that might be changing in your world um, at this point. So I know that you work for Compass Lexicon, and you've been there for quite a while, and I want the title that you own, and I know it's changed a little bit over time, but currently you are the Director of Database Research Worldwide, and you were... Yeah. <laughs> director of database research period before, but now it's a global thing. You have a number of publications. I know your work from Information Today. I know your presentations from both the Computers and Library, Libraries Conference and Internet Librarian. I know you've written a, a book um, or two or three, uh, and I'd like you to, to chat a bit about that. And I have that, Amy, can you fill in the rest? And I know you have a connection to Rutgers. And you have a master's in uh, library and information science from Dominican and a BA in history, Phi Beta Kappa from University of Illinois at Chicago. What are the little pieces that we're missing here or the big pieces? Yeah, um, well, I think so. You mentioned I wrote two books and the first one was on big data and opportunities in big data for librarians and information professionals. But I think that sort of, you know, at the time when I wrote it, big data was new and everyone was wondering what it is and things like that. And now I just think it's just data. Everything's big data. Um, and so I sort of moved into more fake news as a specialty. So I've been studying fake news, disinformation, malinformation, misinformation uh, for a few years. And I wrote a book about that and uh, as a guide for librarians to work with it, help people to evaluate information and use it in our work. And now I'm starting to move into AI stuff and uh, helping people understand how these chatbots work, how AI search tools work, uh, the pitfalls, the promises, what to look for if they're added to one of our databases we subscribe to, um, you know, potential uses, but especially in our work, and I can talk about this more later, it's, it's, there's a lot of pitfalls as far as using it for research goes. So I'm trying to guide people in the organization so that we don't have any mistakes because we work in litigation. So everything has to be correct and cited and uh, we can't have any mistakes. We need to have everything referenced, uh, you know, what the underlying source is. So I've seen this as really an opportunity for librarians to move into AI. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. And I think um, you made a distinction that I think is critical. A lot of us, uh, look, I... I am deeply involved in using chat box for education and um, also just to explore with them. So when I'm looking for movie reviews, that's a very different thing from the kind of work you do where your, your professionalism depends upon the accuracy of the information you present to your clients. And one of the things I, I think we want to make sure our students understand before we move further is that you are a different breed of librarian or information scientist. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your career path and how it might differ from some others in the MI universe? Sure. Um, so I work at Compass Lexicon and I worked here my entire career. So I'm going, it'll be 32 years that I've been here <laughs> uh, next year. So I, I, a lot has changed, but a lot stayed the same in that I remember on one of my first days of work, I was sharing an office with this guy who had been here for a long time. And he said to me, the worst thing you can do here is not have something that the other side has. Because we work in litigation, we send PhD economists to testify at trials as experts. So the opposing side also has an expert. And so we need to make sure they don't have something we don't have. And, and we're like, whoa, that article, we didn't even see that. You know, so we need to be super thorough and then everything has to be absolutely correct because it would be devastating for our firm if we had a, a made up article or something like that. I mean, all of our credibility is on the line with the research that we present. So um, just in our daily work, it's so important that everything is correct. 
Yes. Right. And so if we were to categorize that type of work, um, you are a special librarian, but in some ways you do the work of a law librarian and a business yeah. librarian. <laughs> Right. It's a combination. I always say a corporate librarian or I work at a consulting firm because it is really a combination of finance, business, economics, law. And then sometimes we have esoteric social science thrown in, like sociological studies on, on people's attitudes. Um, sometimes we have psychological impact in things that we're working on. So we look at psych info and databases like that. And then we have even humanities things. Um, so it, it's all over the place. <laughs> so really, it's just really multifaceted. And the subject matter, every day is different. Every request is different. It's really interesting. <laughs> and and it, what's interesting is I read a lot of news before I start my day just to see what's going on. And at, like everything in the news is things that we're working on. So it's really fun. So have, do, you have feed, do you have feed set up? Tons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> up in Factiva mostly um but then I do a scan myself just because I'm so familiar I worked here so long I'm so familiar with what people are interested in so I just do a scan myself of like the Bloomberg website and um, I have some people I follow on Twitter to see what's going on um but I so have a it's across it's across um database updates social media news um regular published news and as a search geek, just out of curiosity, um, what's your favorite database? Oh, that's like picking a favorite child or something. I'm gonna try. <laughs> so hard. Um, you know, I, I really like Bloomberg. I mm -hmm. I have a subscription to the website just my own that I have just for my own use, and I. I go to it all the time just to see what are the current headlines because and it's all over the place. Like there's a lot of financial news, but there's a lot of human interest too. And the tech side is really good. And then I have to say my second favorite one is probably the Wall Street Journal, just because it's changed too a lot in recent years. It's not just business news. It's a lot of news that you just don't get anywhere else. And I know, um, you know, just like the other day, I was listening to NPR Marketplace and the host said, Oh, I'm going to talk about something. I bet nobody knows this, but I saw this in the Wall Street Journal, but I bet none of our, our listeners are going to know this. You know, who sells the most sushi in the United States? And I knew it was Kroger Supermarket because I just read it in the Wall Street Journal. They had this whole feature about, you know, who would believe people buy sushi at Kroger. So I, I just think it's fascinating. It's things from all over the place, movie reviews, tidbits like that. And then that was actually really applicable to a case I was working on here. So... Oh, well. <laughs> so, all right. So I think that um, you covered a little bit of this, but you you had that advice from that colleague early on. But um, for people who want to be like you, um, what what would an employer expect of an information professional to assume a job like you you have, but at an entry level? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is thoroughness and accuracy, at least to have a job like mine, to look everywhere, leaving no stones unturned. And with the accuracy, I always, we have a, I have a great team of people that I work with and we're always asking each other, could you double check this? Do you think I'm missing something? Can you think of a database I might not have tried? You know, just the thoroughness and the accuracy. And I think for every job, you need to have that, um, you know, it's the thrill of the hunt. I think, you know, you have to be really curious and want to find the answer. Like, I, you know, when you hear things, like if I hear who who sells the most sushi, I, if I, even if I hadn't read that, I, I kind of wonder like, yeah, who does? <laughs> like you have to be really curious about all kinds of things. I, and I think you, you can bring that to the table at any job. Um, if, if you read a lot in your spare time and, and listen to things, um, but I, but I think a lot of it, at least for me, and, and also always keeping on top of what's new in the databases, because I know before, even just the last time we talked, uh, you know, the reps for the databases would do a lot of training and come in and talk to you. And we're seeing less and less of that. And it puts more of a burden on us to make sure we're looking at these things they send out, like here's the new features. They don't promote it that heavily. So you have to stay on top of it and keep looking to see what are new search fields. Like I just saw in Bloomberg Law the other day, they have a whole bunch 
more search fields I didn't even know were there that they just added and no one told us. <laughs> so you have to just kind of keep looking. Even if you go to a database, just you know the search you want to do, just sort of look around at the other ones too that you might not be using that day just to see what's new. You said a whole bunch of things I just want to push into a little bit. Um, <laughs> one of them is that, you know, however good you are, you're not going to know everything about every question that's posed to you. And your network, whether they're sitting next to you or somewhere online that you you just know, you, you know these people, you can check in with other people who have expertise in an area that you're new at. And one of the things we, we look at a lot is just seeing what librarians have done, which libguides about what specific, um, very niche topic that we don't know much about, because there's somebody out there who has done some of this work in exploring before you did. And it's a great way to get up to speed um, rather than imagine that you've covered it all. And to some degree, there's a kind of interdisciplinarity about some of these topics and ideas. The sushi thing, you know, you'll find in business, you'll find in the world of food publications, perhaps, uh, you know, and, and things like that. So, um, so working with your colleagues to double check things or to just explore knowledge you don't have, I think is, is, is kind of important and keeping up with um, what's new in these databases. We think we know new fields are kind of exciting because they give us so much power, right? Yeah. And these were good. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> good fields. <laughs> you can choose the type of document. So now we can choose, um, you know, motions, you know, now we can choose reports. It used to be we're doing a free text search for motion within 10 of expert, within 10 of strike. You know, I mean, was, and then and you were just- I'm just thinking so about false. the nightmare using the word motion as free text would be, right? Yeah, I mean, so many falsehoods. And it would just be hours literally combing through the things, trying because we're always looking for a needle in a haystack. So it, it's a lot of piecing through things and trying to find what you're looking for. So that was huge for us. Okay. So let's move forward a little bit because <laughs> we've talked a little bit about the profession, the importance of keeping up, the skills that you would need. Um, so we are, we, we, I think one of the things we did in an earlier um, talk was you shared with us um, some very lengthy syntax about your dialogue searching. And I've told everybody they don't need to be Amy Affelt, but perhaps use simpler searches and evolve the syntax as you learn uh, and save your sets and, 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 and do things in a small building blocks kind of way. But one of the things I've been noticing is that um, within Dialog, there are more user supports than there had been when we started. And I started very early <laughs> when Dialog started, I think, but um yeah. But it's evolving, isn't it? I mean, what are you noticing that's changing in the search environment that you're appreciating or not appreciating? Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of a double-edged sword. I think, you know, as they try to get more customers and, and users, um, they, they do sort of water it down. So we have to always, at least for our purposes here, we're always going to the advanced search tab, trying to figure out when they change things around, how do we get back to where we can use connectors and truncation and things like that. And it's harder to find, I think, um, where like where are the guides that show you the truncation, the proximity from connectors, what all you can do. And I think one thing like with Refinitiv, which was Thomson Reuters, which now is LSEG, they change the name all the time. But with that, you know, it just gets harder and harder to do a free text search in their analyst reports. And um, sometimes that doesn't work in databases that say they have that. If you have a complex search string, it just can't handle that, even though they say that it could. So that really is a learning opportunity for us because then you're sort of forced to make it simpler. So you have to decide which terms are the most important when it can only handle a few, you know, which so terms will. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so just stepping back for a minute. So what I'm hearing you say is that um, you're checking what we now call the pro sheets, or maybe we're not the pro sheets, or or the individual what the database puts out up front as their their helps in terms of truncation and and other strategies. 
Um, you're also moving from command line to advanced search um, to check things out. Um, not exactly sure what you were meaning by that. And we're talking a lot about moving between control vocabulary and free text search. Um, and I want to make sure that all these things are clear to, to, to our class. Um, so you use free text. I'm not even sure where to start, but you use free text when um, a term might be new or you imagine it's going to be somewhere in the title uh, because the professionals who write this stuff use it. Um, it's colloquial perhaps, or jargon to some group, or it's, it's like what the word out there in the, in the journalism universe might be. Um, and then you use, um, control vocabulary when you want to make sure you're grabbing everything that's associated with a topic or a, or a word, um, or in a field. Help me out with this. <laughs> Um, so private controlled vocabulary, what, what did you mean by that? Um, the stuff that you'll find in the source um, uh, or the... Oh, yeah. I mean, usually we sort of have an idea of what's going to be, you know, which terms we should use. But I just mean, like, sometimes we want to try a whole bunch of ors and it with some things in the title and it with some other things in the table of contents. And some search engines just can't handle all that. So it really forces us to take a step back and think, okay, what's our best search? What's our best chance to get what we want with a more simple search of just a few keywords? Um, so, you know, that's sort of where we are right now. I mean, I, where it used to be the old dialogue, you could have five lines of search terms, you know, and I think, you know, databases just aren't set up for that anymore because most people are not doing it. So we're sort of forced to try to figure out what are the best terms to what's our best chance to get what we need. All right. So, so you, are you really maximizing your use of advanced search these days? Yeah. I mean, I think I do try to use it as much as I can to, to the extent that it actually has the capability to do what I want, but sometimes it just doesn't. So. Sometimes I notice that there are fewer fields available in the advanced search. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They have it set up weird, like it's boxes, like you fill out the first box, that's the title, then you pull down an and or an or or a not, and then you have another box. I mean, it's just, I, I just feel not that confident that it's actually doing that <laughs> than if I type the whole thing in. Um, and just trying to make sure we have everything, it makes me a little bit nervous to not have that capability. But, you know, you got to go with what you got. So it, a lot of it is, is, you know, what's our best chance at getting the best results? Okay, I want to talk about what skills do you think are most important and then um, how we're kind of, um, I guess the word is pivoting, to include AI in our skill sets. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said we're not going to know about everything, right? <laughs> right? But you have to know where to look or at least where to find someone who can help you find the source. You know, I think the main thing is the sources. We get a lot of reference questions from people here just wanting to know where would I go for X, Y, or Z. So I think being able to figure out, because we're not going to know also where they would go. I mean, off the top of my head, I wouldn't know certain databases. There's just no easy questions anymore. And Mary Ellen Bates, the last time I heard her speak, said that, and it's just so true. I mean, the questions are just really difficult. Nobody's asking for the capital of Mongolia or something like when I was right out of library school, because we'd get stuff like that because there was nowhere to find it. But, um, you know, it's just very difficult. So I think just what's really important is knowing where to look for things. Um, where to potentially find something because, you know, sometimes you can't find what people are looking for. And I think, you know, you never want to say, sorry, I can't find that with no explanation. We always want to say, I couldn't find that, but this is what I did find. Right. Um, if you have more information, I can look further. Um, you know, you don't want to just stop with, you know, no can do. <laughs> so um, I, I think knowing where to look is really, really important. Um, and being able to give people options when you can't find what they one of the things I, I, I tried with AI recently was to discover how much it knew about database thesauri. 
And so I asked um, it to go across the database thesauri. I gave some, the names of four, four thesauri. <laughs> and I said, can you retrieve the subject headings and the, the, the exploded subject headings for um, ADHD across these thesauri? And so instead of me, and I'm not sure how current they are, but it was a great start. And it, it gave me across like info, um, um, Eric, Mesh, and I forget, it may have been the ProQuest general um, thesaurus. And it gave me a really great way to start. And I had subject headings that I hadn't thought about as they related to the different disciplines. And I thought, oh, this is an interesting use of AI. Yeah. I and it was one page to compare everything to. Yeah. I think with AI, so I'll just say, I always think of Lewis Carroll, like when it's good, it's very, very good. And when it's bad, it's awful. I mean, sometimes it is good. I, I mean, like recipes, like you said, movie reviews, and sometimes it's just, just spot on and it can give people ideas of where to look. I mean, I think that might be something that it's okay for as far as actual research is giving you ideas of where to look for something. I mean, maybe it would be able to say, oh, here's some industry associations to check or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think it's- I've been using it to identify database reference portals as well. And yeah. um, while I can find more, it can find a number of very good ones in a very short time and, and give me a start. And so I think about it as dot connecting rather than finding the perfect answer. Yeah, and it's always good to check more places. So it's good as long as I think, as long as everyone is always checking what results you get. This is the owl. I'm probably getting muffled. Okay, it's going by. Um, <laughs> but I think, as well, I'll talk louder. I, I think um, now it's gone. So now do I sound okay? You sound great now. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think as long as you're unchecking the underlying references it gives, it's another place to check. And it's always better to check more than less. Yeah, so are you seeing the databases themselves incorporate AI tools into research? So they keep sending out these announcements. I just got one from LexisNexis yesterday. We're gonna do this. If you're interested, contact your sales rep. It's a beta test right now. I'm seeing a lot of things like you have to opt in. Like we use the reprints desk a lot for document delivery and they have this opt in thing, you know, and we have a policy here that, you know, we're not using chat GPT and it said it would be using chat GPT. So I cannot opt into that right now, but I think going forward, it, what will happen is they probably will incorporate AI into their back end search engine. Engines. And I think hopefully, I mean, the best case scenario for me is that it'll just be a seamless process. I won't have to see, you know, exactly what the chat GPT is doing with the databases. Um, but is if we're contracting and licensing the content from these databases, I'm confident that they are vetting their results that they're giving to us. So I think that'll be the best case scenario for us is that the AI is enhancing the searches that we do, enhancing the offerings the databases have, and they're guaranteeing the validity. So we don't have to go. I mean, I, I can't imagine a world where we're checking Westlaw because they're using chat GPT and we can't trust it. So you know, really, it's going to be helpful, I think, if they do. Well, I, I wonder, though, um, you know, because we're the stuff that we are discovering, we're discovering because of metadata, because indexers have established these terms and allowed us to search them. But when you can upload a killer paper into a database and ask it, ask the database uh, to use um, an AI tool to look through the corpus of words within a database that already exists, not the stuff outside of it necessarily, then you're leveraging the content within the database to discover things um, that have connections to what you're doing that you may not discuss, have discovered based on traditional indexing. And I think that could be really powerful. Yeah, incredibly powerful. I mean, that's one thing I'm very optimistic about, that it will be able to do things like that. And just uh, in legal research, if there were some way to, with docket to do, to do better, I mean, it's just it's got to be better to be able to say, 
who were the experts in this case? You can't do that. I mean, it's a manual process of doing keyword searches, looking through documents. Um, you know, there isn't always a, a list of the experts. And it, if it could do something like that, I mean, I have such a wish list, like with government data. Um, I have yeah. actually an article coming out in November in computers and libraries on go finding government data. And it just, it's getting better, but it's just so slow. And we're just inching along. I mean, if AI could just, if I could just say, I just need this basic data set from the BLS, you know, because if you go to their website, it's just so Byzantine. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, it just is. It never is that straightforward to find a data set of data on, you know, whatever. I, I, I really, I'm so optimistic it'll help with combing through stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I think it will. I think that the next time we arrange one of these chats will be like, gushing over how much more wonderful it's gotten and speaking I about so. <laughs> <laughs> no i really think this is not beyond the realm of like pretty soon possibility uh because i'm seeing it with some of some of the databases already I, i'm uh, and some of the new search tools that are research based you are able to upload these papers and see all sorts of analysis like who's connected to who um, and those experts, I think, will pop when we can do this stuff. So yeah, it's for document searching like that, document analysis. This is what we have to pin our hopes on because there isn't something right now. I mean, this is this is what if something is going to do, it's going to be this. So I, I think that's right. And and we talk about ChatGPT, but there's a whole bunch of academic um, AI-based search tools out there right now. And Bing is using AI to return citations and is going beyond um, the corpus of trained data to to search the web for for updates. And so, so I'm I'm hopeful that these things are just going to get better and better. But we'll still be critical about what they can and cannot do. And yeah, I mean, they're not really that's searching. The point that I want to make, and that you just made, is that this is what people don't understand that we can harness as our superpower as librarians is that people think chat GPT, this is the L, can you hear me? Okay. People think chat GPT and AI are the same thing. They think there's only one thing and it's chat GPT. No, that's just one tool. The, you know, AI search is not the same thing. I mean, you could have a great AI search tool. You know, when people are down on chat GPT, that's not the same thing as all these other tools out there. So that's just one. So I think that's something we need to educate people about and, and about AI tools and their potential and the differences between ChatGPT because ChatGPT really was the first mover. I mean, it's been out since last November. It's the first thing we heard about. And typically the first mover, it doesn't end up being the king of the hill in the end, so like Betamax you know, or some, something like that. So, you know, I, I think... I was thinking about it a lot. I saw this movie called Blackberry and it was about the Blackberry and how it got superseded by the iPhone. And it was really a superior product, but it just iPhone took over. And um, I just thought about that. You know, you have these initial tools that was like the first smartphone um, that come out and that usually isn't the end game in the end. So I think you know, it's important to understand ChatGPT is just sort of the beginning and there's so much more that can happen. And I think that's what we need to impress upon people because, you know, it's just not the same thing at all. And that's the role for librarians that I'm so excited about is we can be the AI experts. And I think for people already working out there, special librarians at corporations and law firms or really, I guess, any type of organization, if you can establish yourself as the go-to person for AI, you don't have to understand programming. You don't have to know how to build an AI tool. But if you can explain to people in plain language how lang large language models work, what AI can do, how that's different from Google, I mean, you're going to position yourself as the person that everybody's going to ask and get on committees and boards within your organization when people, because that's what's going to happen, I think, is that the people are going to have AI committees at every company, you know, and you want to get on that committee. So it's important to get out there and say a lot about AI and, and do that because that's a new role for us. And I think it's really promising. I, I think it's exciting and promising. And there really is no excuse for an information professional to opt out of that. Yeah. 
I know this is our time. Like, and I saw this, you know, a few, I'm sure you did too. A few months ago, there were all these articles, prompt engineer, you can make $300,000 a year, you know, well, we could be the prompt engineer. That's just a reference interview. (laughs) Do this. That's just crafting a dialogue search. Basically the prompt is the dialogue search that this is our time. I really think that. I'm, this is just such a, I'm feeling so excited about all that you just said. I know. <laughs> all right. But last question. Okay. All right. Um, and I, maybe we already did this. What excites you most about your work? It's just, I, I think, as I said, you know, trying to find what people need when I do find what they're looking for and they think it's unfindable, that just nothing can replace that feeling. I mean, I think everyone goes into librarianship because you want to help people, whether that's helping them file their taxes, helping them learn English, or helping them at a company find some obscure document they didn't think was findable. When you find it, even if it's just they sort of say, oh, yeah, thanks, whatever. You're taking so much pressure off the people, at least in a corporate setting, because they have what they need. They're, they're changing somebody's life at a public library. I mean, that that just excites me in general. I don't work at a public library, but when I think about these librarians that do, they're on the front line of all of this book banning stuff, and, and they're, but they're changing people's lives every day. I mean, this is... Amazing. I, I always think about these few studies that show like what are the most trusted professions. And it's always firefighters, nurses, and librarians. And I think it was maybe a year ago or two years ago, librarians got number one. And I think we're gonna hold we beat nurses. I think we're gonna hold number one with this book ban stuff because most people are not for banning books and they are looking to us to be on the front lines. And it is really scary when you see things like bomb threats and, and things like that. But you know. It, it, somebody's got to do it and then we're going to do it and people are on our side most people are not for that they are against it they want freedom of speech freedom to read and i think people are going to look to us to do that more and more i think we're just going to get more and more important so that excites me just about the profession in general and in my work i just see it a lot of opportunity with things like ai i, I feel like nobody really wants to take that responsibility. And I think we can do that. Like you said, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to do that. Because I think at first, it's it's a natural reaction to think, oh, you know, this is sort of like computer programming and not my my lane or whatever. But, um, you know, no, I think I'm really excited because people are confused and intimidated, even at the top levels of companies. I think they really are concerned. So it's our chance to be the expert. And I, something people really care about and need to know about. I, I love it. And 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 it is a new environment. And in, in, in the education environment, we're setting new norms for um, what creativity looks like, um, for our expectations of academic honesty, um, and for what research looks like right now and how we don't dismiss all tools, any any tool just out of hand, or I'm not sure what the expression is, but we figure out how to incorporate it into our toolkit thoughtfully, ethically, and professionally. So, Amy, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs>